world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Three and a half decades ago, the world was moving very rapidly toward a Cold War turning into a fire of destruction. Already for much of the world, from the Middle East to Afghanistan, from South and Central America to Africa, surrogate hot conflicts raged and millions suffered. In the United States and the Soviet Union, very public demonization had overcome reasoned political discourse and the readiness to use nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction precariously hung over all of our heads. Arsenals were expanding in sophistication and size. Fear hung in the air. Humanity was divided not only by an iron curtain of ideologies, but also by very real walls of military deployments ready to strike. A handful of courageous people looked over these barriers and they envisioned a better way, a way forward. Despite enormous domestic obstacles, institutional inertia, and even cynicism, they stepped forward and they made history. President of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, and United States Secretary of State George Shultz were courageous leaders in that process. I recently reread the memorandum by Ambassador Jack Matlock of a meeting at the United States Mission to the United Nations in October of 1985 in preparation for the upcoming November summit in Geneva of Presidents Gorbachev and Reagan. The sophistication, substance, aspiration to achieve progress and dignity of dialogue exemplified by Foreign Minister Shevardnadze and Secretary Schulz along with very specific proposals to move the world forward, paved the way for a successful summit. It was with intelligence and humanity and sincerity that they made progress. At that summit, the leaders of the United States and the Soviet Union affirmed to the world that a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. They further pledged not to seek military advantage over the other's nation, and to eliminate chemical weapons everywhere. Importantly, they honored our common humanity and the quest for peace with sincerity, and they began building a bridge of trust.
that bridge helped to peacefully move the world beyond the Cold War. Its character was clearly expressed by the historic speech of President Gorbachev to the United Nations in December of 1988, when he called for a cooperative approach to security, a global civilization honoring the values embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, sustainable economic technological systems in harmony with nature, addressing the gross disparities of wealth and inequity on the planet, and obtaining a nonviolent world free of nuclear weapons. From the over 65,000 nuclear warheads then to the less than 14,000 today, progress has certainly been made. But the risks remain utterly unacceptable, and much needs to be done. This vision for a safer, nuclear weapons-free world remains to be fulfilled. That is our task today. It is thus an enormous honor to hear today from President Mikhail Gorbachev and Secretary of State George Shultz, two men who not only made history, it's really fair to say they helped save history. And for that, and I know I express this for millions, millions of people. Thank you so very much. Mikhail, you were dynamite when you were in office. You had imagination, you had strength, you had vision, and you changed things. And with your option under President Reagan, you changed the world. I'm in my hundredth year, but I feel like a promising young man. Let me tell you a story about how things get started and the vital importance of leadership in making that happen. When we came into office in the Reagan period, relations with the Soviets were as cold as they could be. After they invaded Afghanistan, President Jimmy Carter cut off all relations with them. When I came into the, the job of Secretary of State, I worried about this because as Secretary of Treasury, I had dealt with the Soviets and made deals with them that worked and got to know the personalities and had some fun and one or two rather dramatic circumstances. So I was uneasy. I talked to President Reagan who uh, was surrounded by people who wanted to keep things down. And he gave me permission to have weekly meetings with Ambassador de Brennan if the purpose we would stick to the purpose of getting little weeds out of the place before they grew. We had enough problems, so de Brennan was glad to take part. So one day, I'm returning from a trip to China, and I landed Air Force Base. It was snowing. I was lucky to land. And our phone rings. It's Nancy. He says, why don't you, you and your wife come over and have supper with us at the White House? So then they started asking me about Soviet leaders, because they knew I'd dealt with them in the past. And so I brought Brennan over, and we talked about seeing it drop up, and Brennan was reassuring. Then we talked about Soviet Jewry. It wasn't just generalizations. He had names, places, incidents. Then we talked about the Pentecostals, who had brushed in their embassy during the Carter administration. They were still there because if you expel them, they get killed. And what can I do? Reagan kept saying, it's like a big neon sign in Moscow saying, we don't treat people right. We don't let them worship the way they want. We don't let them treat them right. We ought to do something about it. I won't say a word. I just want something to happen. So we're riding back, and I said to the Britain, Let's take on the Pentecostal project, see if we can do something about it. So we did. And after a while, I finally got a piece of paper 
back from the Soviets that I thought was promising, although I could see it had its problems. And I took it over to the president. I said, Mr. President, please don't call your lawyer. He'll point out the holes in this memo. But I have to believe that after all that's preceded this, and this is a pretty good memo, if we get them out of the embassy, they'll be allowed to go home and eventually immigrate. So we decided to do it. And we got them out, and sure enough, they were allowed to go home. And after a period, not only were they allowed to emigrate, but all their families were allowed. It was huge, 50 or 60 people. It was gigantic. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Of course, the press was after us. How did that happen? And Reagan would say nothing. And I always felt that two little things were done as a result of that. On the one hand, Reagan could say, I trust the Soviets to deliver what they say they'll deliver. And they more than did that. And they have to say, he said he wouldn't say anything, and he didn't. And then well knew the temptation of an American politician to take credit for anything. So there's just a little element of trust there. Trust is the coin of the realm. So that built. And I think it was part of the evolution of the relationship between two personal giants. Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And they could interact comfortably with each other because they trusted each other. They knew that the other one would do whatever they said they would do. So that was a big thing. Что хуже всего то, что в последние годы произошел коллапс доверия в отношениях между ведущими державами, которые согласны устав ООН, несут главную ответственность, главную ответственность за поддержание международного права, за безопасность, которая по-прежнему обладает огромными запасами ядерного оружия. И обязаны его сокращать, плод до его ликвидации. Это обязательство договора о нераспространении никто не отменял. Я с огромной тревогой вынужден говорить о милитаризации международных отношений. Это результат вот всей этой всех не ошибок, которые допущены, промахов, крупных, опасных. Проблемы, конфликты последних двух десятилетий, которые вполне можно было бы урегулировать мирными политическими, дипломатическими средствами, пытаются решить путем применения силы. Так было и в бывшей Югославии, и в Ираке. И в Ливии, и в Сирии. Хочу подчеркнуть, что это не привело к решению проблем. Результатом стало расшатывание международного права, подрыва доверия, милитаризации. Милитаризации как политики, так и мышления. И в этих условиях говорить о движении к безъядерному миру становится все труднее. Это надо честно признать. Пока мировая политика не вернется в нормальную колею, пока не произойдет демилитаризация международных отношений, цель совместно обозначенная в Рейкьявике будет не приближаться, а отдаляться. Чтобы изменить такое положение, необходим диалог. Фактический отказ от него в последние годы был самой большой ошибкой. Давно уже пора возобновить его по всей повестке дня, не ограничиваясь обсуждением региональных проблем, по которым существует разногласие. 
В годы, когда мы покончили с холодной войной, мы признали, что помимо национальных и иных интересов, есть общие интересы, прежде всего, предотвращение ядерной войны. So there was supposed to be a meeting in Washington, and the Soviets sent word saying they'd like to have a preliminary meeting before the Washington meeting. We said Reykjavik would be okay because it's isolated. Hofti House had it downstairs, and there was a little room on the side. That's where we met. The room was very small. Reagan's at one end, Gorbachev's at the other end. I'm sitting beside Reagan. Uh, Shevardnadze beside Gorbachev. That's all the interpreters. So it's very intimate. Discussion. We were there for two days, and we had real exchanges. And on the first day, morning, Gorbachev laid on the table all of our negotiating points. He was agreeing to them. Oh, we were astonished. We went back and talked it over our group. And then all of a sudden, he put a condition on everything, that we have to kill the Strategic Defense Initiative. And Reagan had proposed this, and his idea was, that people will sort of will find ballistic missiles and somehow you have to defend yourself against them. And he wasn't about to give it up. So we had on the one hand huge amount of progress, including a world free of nuclear weapons. In the end we couldn't agree on anything. We we did agree in a separate negotiation that human rights would be a regular recognized item on our agenda. That was a breakthrough. I mean, a very important marker. Then we had the Washington summit, which the INF Treaty was signed. That was first big breakthrough of reducing, and eliminated an entire uh, class of nuclear weapons. And these were relatively short range ones, which were very dangerous because the amount of time between when they're fired and when they hit is like nothing. And so the chance to defend yourself is minimal. Um, So uh, well, that took place at Reykjavik. После того, что было сказано, что ядерная война недопустима, что в ней не может быть победителей, и что она не, нельзя остаться в такой ситуации, что надо заняться всей этой нагромождением этим и избавляться от ядерного оружия. Думаю, что Рейкьявик – это действительно то, что останется в истории навсегда. Ибо не будет Рейкьявика того, что хоть и с трудом, но что последовало после него, как начала меняться ситуация отношения. Мы могли прийти такой, когда и ядерное оружие могло при его масштабах и вырваться из-под контроля политического. Поэтому надо было сделать, и мы пошли. Переговоры были интенсивными, очень основательными, прямыми. Были президенты, были министры иностранных дел с ними, и была большая группа инспекторов политических и военных, э, экспертов. Удивительно, что... Все как бы чувствовали, что здесь что-то произойти должно серьезное, что изменит всю ситуацию в мире, все. Обычно неугомонные представители прессы ждали, точно так же, как и все мы, видели, что получается. Начались, мы начали выходить и на договоренности, означающие какие-то детали. То есть все можно, решая, решается. И вот когда вдруг появилась тема о оборону, стратегической оборонной инициативе, я и сейчас даже не могу сказать, что я полностью убежден, что вот это как бы продуманная, выношенная идея. Получается, что вроде бы американцы не очень-то хотели и боялись. 
Ведь не, не, не зря же, не случайно ты еще сказала, еще один рейкьявик мы не выдержим. Не очень они хотели, хотя по разговорах Реган иногда даже первым говорил, мы должны идти к безъядерному миру. Поэтому это вот было, это было самое большое потрясение. И вот драматическое продолжение этой ситуации выглядело так, что мы, договорившись практически обо всем, мы могли получить уже в Великьявике готовый документ. И все оборвалось. Это было, конечно, вообще. Нас заставило это очень серьезно думать о наших партнерах. С какими мыслями, с какими планами, с какими какие у них расчеты. И особенно для меня было важно то, что. Шульцу, улетая с военного, с Рекьявика, в беседе с, с журналистами сказал, что, к сожалению, не состоялось. Высказал разочарование в связи с тем, что прорыв не состоялся. Я За, это, за этот тезис надо было развенчать. Потому что мы так много сделали, действительно заглянули за горизонт, что там уже в безъядерном мире отдать такое на съедение, на уничтожение реакционным силам, прямо скажем. Это было бы недопустимо и непростительно. Я сказал, все рассказал, как есть. И сказал, что это прорыв. На утро Шульцу доложили, что я сказал. И он собрал тут же пресс-конференцию и присоединился в Соединенные Штаты. Это, конечно... Надо воздать должное Шульцу. Он вообще играл весьма конструктивную и позитивную роль. On our learning how to prevent ourselves by being hit from a ballistic missile. So if we prohibit them, let's get rid of all this stuff. And we parted. Since then, things have gone downhill. People think of all kinds of reasons not to do the work. But there is something hopeful beyond simply a belief that a worthwhile goes to get to the promised land. I'm really excited to know that the National Academy of Sciences here has, with some very prominent physicists, once again in touch with their counterparts in Russia, and they're meeting fairly frequently, lining out possible positions and problems, and also getting to know each other. This is a very good development, and it is supported by the fact that the Vatican and the Russian Orthodox Church are trying to do something of similar nature. So, with all of the gloom and doom people are spreading, forget it. Something good is happening, and in the end, the good things will prevail. Dear friends, 
My nuclear journey began 75 years ago. In the summer of 1945, I was a U.S. Marine captain on a troop ship in the Pacific bound for San Diego. Early in the voyage, we heard that something called an atomic bomb had been dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. By the time we reached port in San Diego, a second bomb had been used at Nagasaki. We wouldn't be headed to the Japanese mainland after all. Ronald Reagan believed that nuclear weapons were immoral. My friend Bishop Swing has rightly observed that while the U.S. president may put his hand on the Bible at his inauguration, it is when he puts his hand on the nuclear trigger that he assumes a godlike power. But we are men, not gods. Together with President Gorbachev, we had seen the promised land, but we had not been able to get there during our negotiations. Today, I am alarmed. We live in an unsafe world that grows more dangerous with the proliferation of nuclear weapons. We need to make sure that the global population understands the gravity of the nuclear threat, and we do everything we can to reduce the risks of that threat. But I am also optimistic. I see that wise and knowledgeable people are talking about these crucial issues. Such dialogue can lead to progress, so there is hope. I have seen the promised land, so I know that it exists, and the leaders who can take us there can emerge from among our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Sincerely yours, George P. Schultz. Дорогие друзья, я был очень рад узнать от моего друга Джорджа Шульца, что в связи с 75-й годовщиной атомной бомбардировки Хиросимы ваша организация планирует выступить совместным заявлением о необходимости ликвидации ядерного оружия. It is a passionate appeal to join the fight for a nuclear weapon-free future for all mankind. Fighting for the abolition of nuclear weapons is the civic duty of each and every one of us. Together with you, I am appealing to the citizens of all countries. Put pressure on your leaders, politicians and elected officials. Keep telling them again and again that the very existence of nuclear weapons poses a deadly threat to humanity. Demand that they take concrete action so that the arsenals of nuclear weapons get smaller with every passing year. We started on the road to a world without nuclear weapons in Reykjavik. It turned out to be a difficult and thorny path. But there must be no other goal than the complete elimination, the abolition of nuclear weapons. I wish you the strength of spirit, dedication and perseverance in advancing that goal. С уважением, Михаил Горбачев. で、それはまだ家が潰れた人の下敷きにいる人だった。もう2日目ですから腐ってる。それから不思議に思うことはあの肺がね真っ暗になるくらい人の背中について何百匹という灰が背中についてあの、